Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was going to say welcome to the graveyard shift, but I don't know if the presenters will appreciate me saying that. Okay, okay, they do. Um, and in fact, um, Candice was telling me, our last speaker was saying, procurement is always the graveyard shift for some reason. Um, but I actually think, I mean, this was the session before Catherine asked me to come and chair this. This was the one I really want, I was most excited about. So, and these speakers are really fantastic and in terms of the range of things they're covering as well. Um, I also think it really ties together the themes we've heard today. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about, and this has all been said in other sessions, but we've got all these targets as part of strategies. How do we achieve these targets? Part of it is we don't have enough infrastructure. We need infrastructure. Um, what are the constraints on infrastructure? Some of them are tons and, and feedstock certainty, long-term contracts, um, having certainty to invest. Uh, what are the issues, the next stage in the, in the issues? Well, that can lead to you know, joint procurement is one answer to that or one thing that can help that. Um, what, but all the challenges with joint procurement in terms of regulation, in terms of getting people together. Um, and so the range of speakers we've got today, it, it kind of ties that all together. Um, because we've got uh, Sarah from the EPA talking about joint procurement model and, and a, 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 sorry, a, a team of, I got, yeah, a group to, to help advise councils and, and make it easier for joint procurement. And we've, you know, we've got Nick, who, Nick Page who's got incredible experience um, from the waste contracting side in procurement processes. Uh, we have um, Charlotte who um, does, uh, it has huge background um, in looking at business cases for um, infrastructure projects and is going to talk about harmonisation. And then we've got Candice who's going to tie it all together with a, with a practical business, or practical case study um, of how sort of a collaborative framework can work. Um, our first speaker um, is Sarah Larkin. Um, she's the, a manager of policy and major projects initiatives at the EPA. Um, and as I said, she's leading the design and delivery of New South Wales Government Joint Procurement Facilitation Service, which was referred to and, and described in the, in the waste strategy, which um, Sarah also played a part in preparing and producing. Um, and previously, she's worked with Deloitte, ACCC, and is very experienced. Thank you so much everyone for coming today um, and thank you very much for the lovely uh, introduction. Um, before I do get stuck into the presentation today, I just wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, as the introduction said, my name is Sarah Larkin. Um, I'm one of the managers at the, e in, at the New South Wales EPA um, in our policy division. Um, and I'm really excited that I get to have the opportunity to have a chat to you today um, about our new Joint Procurement Facilitation Service. Um, it is a brand new service um, that the New South Wales Government is leading um, and is specifically being led by the EPA. Um, and it's there to provide support for councils in New South Wales for waste procurement. Uh, with a big focus on the major waste contracts that councils are entering into, uh, particularly with processing, um, potentially also collections as well. And really, um, the service is all about supporting joint procurement and supporting procurement uh, with the aim of really trying to get good value for money for ratepayers, um, as well as providing an opportunity to work together at the state and the local level on achieving circular economy outcomes. So that leads in then to what the focus of today is. And what I really wanted to um, focus on for the presentation today is how we've collaborated and partnered with local government in how we've designed this service. Um, and designed it in a way um, where we've really tried to reflect um, what's needed um, at the local government level. So just a bit of an outline so you know what's coming. Um, I'm just going to begin with just a little bit of context setting about the origins of the service and where it came from. 
Um, I'll then move through to start talking about our co-design approach, um, what it involved and what some of the key themes were that came out of that process. And then I'll provide an overview of the scope of the service and the initiatives that we're hoping to deliver, um, which reflect, um, hopefully, um, what came out of that, the feedback that we received through that co-design process. In. So just to start with the scene setting, um, so as, been, as has been mentioned, um, the Joint Procurement Facilitation Service um, was an announcement made under the Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy. Uh, in the strategy, um, it included a commitment um, to fund a service with $16 million over five years. And in the strategy, the commitment that was made with respect to the service was very much a high-level commitment, um, stating that uh, the that government um, would, uh, that the announcement, sorry, um, would be followed by detailed um, consultation with local government on what the scope of the service would deliver. So that leads then to the process that we've undertaken to design the service. So when we set out upon deciding how we were going to tackle this, we wanted to choose an approach that would allow us to work really collaboratively with local government. We felt that this co-design approach was needed because we are not the experts in waste procurement we are also not the experts in knowing what your local communities need um, and what their expectations are with respect to waste management. That's something that you, the, you as councils, um, are very much best placed to provide comment on. So with that in mind, we really wanted to work together on how we can use this service as a way in which we can deliver state outcomes and targets, as well as what you need at the local level as well. The need for the co-design process was also very much compounded by the fact that the announcement for this facilitation service was that it was to be voluntary, um, which means that it also must be demand driven and therefore it's really critical that it does reflect what councils need. So to give you an overview of the process that we undertook, um, we did this in three key stages. So the first was through a series of one-on-ones and some targeted engagement, which, where we were trying to have a real focus on what are the opportunities and challenges that councils are facing when they're going out to tender for waste contracts, and what would be the benefits of addressing these challenges as well as enabling joint, more joint procurement. That then allowed us to work together to design a set of options that the service could, about what the scope of the service could deliver which we were able to take out for broad testing across local government. That then fed into the final stage, which was really around narrowing and refining that scope um, and then developing up the set of initiatives that have recently been announced and that I'll talk through in the next slide in a moment. But before I get there, I wanted to share with you um, some of the key feedback um, that we received through this consultation, through this engagement process and that has really fed into how we've shaped up this service and what we're, what we're proposing to deliver. And it f the feedback that we receive falls across three key categories. There's a lot of feedback that we received specifically on joint procurement, a lot of feedback that we received on waste procurement in general, um, but also some really sage advice as well for us to, as the EPA to keep in mind in terms of how we deliver this kind of support. So I'll touch on each now. So with respect to joint procurement, um, we, you know, we very much heard and we understood um, that the, there's a range of experiences with joint procurement to date. Um, there are many councils that have done it and they've done it quite well and they've thought that it's been very beneficial for their communities. There's been others that have tried it or considered it, but it hadn't necessarily worked for them or they decided not to go ahead. And then we also heard from a number of councils who told us that joint procurement was not an option for them and not something that they would look to actively consider. With respect to the benefits that we heard around joint procurement, there were a range of them. Um, and they ranged from things like providing access to a broader range of waste and recycling services, um, being able to streamline administrative processes, as well as being able to share resources, skills and solutions. 
But what we also heard was some really hard and well-earned lessons about joint procurement and how complex it can be. And so as part of that, we also heard then some of the really critical success factors around joint procurement from those that had found it um, successful. So some of those key areas included the considerable amount of commitment, dedication and trust that needs to exist across the council offices that are getting involved in these projects. There was also some really, really critical learnings with respect to uh, the importance of early planning for procurement as well as getting the alignment between your strategic priorities, uh, risk appetites, and how to approach the procurement process. And then backing all of that up was also some really strong learnings with respect to governance as well, and the importance of having really clearly defined roles and responsibilities between the councils involved, as well as finding ways in which to make sure that council, each council um, is involving and engaging their executive staff and developing a governance structure that's going to be able to withstand a multi-year process, potentially a process that might also fall over council elections as well. And then of course, um, can't forget the other important factor when going into joint procurement as well, and just the added resourcing and timing that's needed to obtain the ACCC approvals. So that reflects a lot of the feedback that we received with respect to joint procurement. But certainly when we um, were embarking on this process, um, we definitely um, couldn't go past also understanding what some of the broader challenges and opportunities were with respect to procuring waste services, whether councils are doing that together or doing that individually. And the, I guess the key themes that were really coming through um, in that area was the real need to make sure that there's specialised expertise, that you've got the skills internally within council and also having access to market and procurement knowledge both at all, sorry, across all stages of the pro procurement process from the planning right through to um, tendering and negotiating. And then lastly, as I touched on, we also received some really sage advice with respect to getting involved in joint procurement and state government providing any support in this space. And some of the key themes that came out of that were that there's already a wealth of experience that exists within local government with respect to waste procurement as well as joint procurement. And it would be really helpful if, there was a, if the service um, provided a way in which for councils to be able to build relationships with one another and also to be able to share that experience across the sector. The other thing that came through very strongly, um, which I'm sure many of you will know in this room, is that there's very significant differences um, across all local councils, and that if when we're designing any kind of support for waste procurement, we really need to make sure that we're not trying to design a one-size-fits-all approach, and that we're designing something that can be delivered in a way that's really flexible and adaptable to reflect what those different needs are. The last thing that came through really strongly as well is that joint procurement may not always be the most beneficial option for a council um, and that the service should not, certainly not be forcing councils to jointly procure and that there may actually be benefit um, in the service helping councils to weigh up what their different procurement options are. So, with that in mind then, um, I will then move to um, the scope of the joint procurement service that we've announced and how we've built on that high level announcement that was made in the waste strategy. So what we've sought to do is to really reflect all of that feedback that we received in the co-design process and to develop a design for the service that's going to provide access to councils, provide councils with access to expertise, information and guidance so that for you to plan, negotiate and tender for waste contracts. So there's several initiatives that are making up the Joint Procurement Facilitation Service and I'm going to firstly just run through and explain what each of those initiatives are and then I'll come back and um, sort of explain how they all tie together and, and what it looks like in terms of getting access to the service, particularly if you are based in New South Wales. 
So with respect to the initiatives, they're listed here up on the slide if you want to follow along. Um, so the first is that we are making available a pool of funding that councils will be able to tap into if you're exploring or undertaking a joint procurement and that that funding pool will enable you to get access to expertise that you might need when going through that procurement process. Then to be able to help support you to find the experts that you need to advise on those services, um, we're also looking to set up a panel of qualified experts. We're then looking to provide um, a, a access to data, information and analysis that can help councils to make informed decisions in procurement um, across all stages of the procurement process. They'll then be made available a library of materials um, that will be able to be tapped into on demand. And that library of materials will be something that we add to over time and will include things like training, um, as well as various guidance materials for your staff, for council staff. And then the other key thing that we are looking to do is to make sure, reflecting that feedback, is that there is a mechanism and an opportunity within the service for councils to be able to learn from one another, um, whether that be through case studies or other things. And so to bring all of these initiatives together, what we've also established through the service is a dedicated concierge. The intent of the concierge um, is to be there to coordinate the delivery of all of these initiatives, but also to be there to provide really tailored guidance and support on procurement. The, we intend that the concierge is going to be quite proactive um, so we are aiming that the concierge will be reaching out to all councils within New South Wales and to have conversations with you about um, where you're willing, of course, um, where you're up to um, with your current waste contracts, um, what your experience has been, any challenges that you're facing, and also to potentially help to identify where there may be beneficial opportunities for you to work with other councils. The concierge is also intended to be reactive as well. So what we're seeking to establish by having this concierge is to have a single point of contact within the EPA that will be able to respond to any queries, any questions that you have with respect to waste procurement and provide that point of contact within state government. So I'm almost finished, moving almost onto the last slide. So how all this is going to work together and how can you get involved if you are a council in New South Wales? So in short, if you are working on or exploring a joint procurement for one of your major waste contracts, you may be able to seek from the service tailored advice and support um, through making use of our concierge and through the funding pool. And that can potentially provide you with both in-kind and financial support up to $500,000. And even if you're not doing a joint procurement, or you're, but you're undertaking a, a waste procurement more generally, or even if you're not sort of looking for more of that tailored in-depth support, what we're seeking, what will be established under the service is a set of resources that you're going to be able to tap into on demand. And so the things like the information and data, the guidance materials and the training will be things that you'll be able to access regardless of whether or not you're doing joint procurement and is hopefully resources that we will continue to build over time as we move further into the implementation of the service. So I'm going to wrap up here, um, but I wanted to say that um, if you do want to get in touch and want to talk further about the service, um, we do now have our dedicated concierge set up. I have the details on the screen here of Marcel and Cameron um, who are very willing to chat to ev anybody and everybody about the service. Um, so please do get in touch with us and very happy to answer any questions at the end as well that you might have too. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Sarah. I should have said at the beginning, um, we're going to have questions at the end, um, partly because that's what the panellists want, partly because um, they all sort of fit together, so we thought that would be a good idea, and partly because there's no microphone until the end. <laughs> um, the, the next speaker we've got 
Yeah, we're really lucky. We've got Nick Page, who's the general manager of tendering con and contracts at JJ Waste. Um, he's an amazing resource to have to, to come up here and talk about this topic, given that for 18 years um, he's been working in this area, um, and JJ's currently got 56 contracts. Uh, or no, sorry, that that's 56. Sorry, f contracts with 56 councils. There may be more contracts for different... Ca no? 56 contracts? What did that'll do? There's lots of contracts <laughs> with lots of councils. Um, and Nick's been involved in getting those processes together and, and actually in the delivery of those contracts. Thanks, Josh. Uh, there's some seats down the front if anyone at the back wants to sit down or you're good. Okay, let's see how this works. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about the industry response to local council procurement. Um, I work with councils and consultants and one of the things I've been doing is I work with Catherine from Impact on certain tenders and I think she's sick of me complaining, so she said, can I come up here and talk to you guys about it? So what we're looking at is a focus on local government tenders from a contractor's point of view. And why is it important? Well, it's expensive and it's time consuming. Um, it's a significant annual spend for the councils um, and they're very long-term contracts. We're seeing contracts now up to 15 years and they impact your whole community. So the idea of the tender process is to select the best value proposal so it can lead to a successful contract over the term. So as Josh said, I've been doing tendering for 18 years for JJ's. Um, we are a family business. Uh, we're a private company. Uh, we've been operating for 90 years. Uh, we collect over 3 million wheelie bins a week. And we have our own engineering facility where we build our own truck bodies and we have our R&D department. So the first thing I want to talk about is timelines. How long does it take? So our tendering department is centralized. We have 12 people in our tendering department. So it's quite a significant department for the company. Um, we obviously have to get the documents in. The documents nowadays are getting bigger and bigger. We've got more legal people like Josh involved writing complicating contracts for us. We need to read the documents. We then need to prepare questions. And then we physically drive to your collection area. We drive every street to make sure we've got the right equipment and we've got the hours right. Uh, then we've got to produce a financial an analysis, and obviously we need to do a submission. So one thing you need to ask yourself is how complex is your specification? So are you asking for things like bins? Are you looking to introduce FOGO services, glass services? Are you asking us to take it to a variety of disposal locations? Have you got things like bulk bins, curbside cleanup, etc.? The more complicated it is, the more time we need. And what we're talking about is anywhere between six and ten weeks. When we're talking about contract establishment, if you'd asked me this probably pre-COVID, I'd say we need between six and nine months. Nowadays, you're talking at least 12 months um, with supply chain issues. So the way it works for us is when we win a contract, we order the trucks from Volvo, who's our supplier in France. They then go to the build queue. So we then wait in the queue till our trucks are built. But it doesn't end there. Then what happens is we've got to wait for a ship, and there's problems with international shipping, etc. Then they come into Brisbane, and then they have to go to the Volvo factory. Now, what the Volvo mod factory does is it takes a truck that comes out of the factory, which is a right-hand steer, and it has to become a dual steer. So for those who don't know, when the driver's collecting on his left, he's driving on the left-hand side of the truck next to his lifter, and then when he's driving normally, say, to the tip, he's driving on the right side. So we're, we're limited by Volvo's capacity in that mod, mod shop to modify those to dual steer. Then it's got to go to our engineering facility where we add a body, hydraulics, etc., computers. And then we have to wait for council delivery, we need to PD it, we need to test them, we need to send it back to council area. So 12 months at the moment is the very minimum. For certain other truck scanners, etc., the wait's even longer. So you need to be thinking at least two years out about when you're going to go to tender. If, you're, if your tender ends in July 25, you should be thinking about starting the process right now. And then you need to think about what other councils are going to tender at the same time. Now, this is a snapshot of February this year. Um, 
there are nine domestic tenders in the market, including Bunbury, which had seven associated shires. shires. So you're talking about almost 16 councils. Now, as we said, we're a very well-resourced company, quite experienced, and there are tender opportunities here that we had to pass by. We could not tender them all. Um, and I'm not quite sure about our competitors, but I'm sure they felt the same frustration. So how can you help us? We need accurate information. If you've got a rural council, we need to know exactly where your bins are. We need, we need to know which roads we go down, which roads we don't go down. If you've got a, a city area with lots of, say, units, we need to know if you've got bin bays, where those bin bays are, are they in car parks, do we have to go and get the bins, are the bins presented, etc. And then we're looking at other information. If you've got commercial public place, how, how often are they serviced, when are they serviced? We're looking at service growth, weights of the bins, how many bins are you replacing, and then collection area maps which define the day of service. And then if you've got difficult access or early start streets, then tell us what those are so we can check them out because some areas, you might have difficult access streets, uh, streets where we actually need specialised equipment. Eliminate maybes and vague, ambiguous statements. And I'll give you a couple of examples because I could give you a hundred examples. But as soon as you have a phrase that says something like council may, then it's going to introduce a big risk for us. Um, and I've got a few examples. Um, so this first example was basically an area where, of the council shire, there was currently about 25% of, of, the, of the shire was provided with the service. The rest of it wasn't. So what the clause said is the areas to be serviced in the council area is depicted on the service area map. While the maps identify the current service area, council has designated the entire council area for the service and services may therefore expand to the new areas during the term of the contract. So what that means is that they could send us anywhere in the 70% of the other shire whenever they fancied at any point. And then the bottom bit says the timing and phasing of the extension will be in consultation with, con with the contractor, but will be at council's discretion. Now, that's just impossible for us to, to work out how much that is. Uh, going back to the bulk bins, so this is from a contract where it's asking us, and it, 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 it's, what it says is fine. So it says, so that some premises will need MGBs bought from storage areas to be emptied and then returned to bin storage areas. Some premises will have maintenance workers that will present the MGBs, and then the contractor will return them. Where MGBs are not presented, the contract must wheel them to the collection vehicle and return, return them after you've serviced them. The problem with it is that they, didn't, they couldn't and didn't tell us which was which. So the difference in collecting a bin from the curbside and the difference to, say, going to an underground car park, not only does it take much longer, but it could be a completely different bit of equipment. So what this introduces, it introduced a complete unknown risk to us. So if you've got units, you need to provide us with what the connect collection methodology is in that unit, i.e. it's underground, it's behind a locked door, etc. It's presented. Please call your disposal and processing contracts first so we know where we're going. One of the frustrations is we, we have contracts where we don't really know and we're either provided a list of disposal locations or in this example, 16.5.3, the approved delivery destination to be taken is within 35 kilometers. Now, if I asked, does anyone know how long it takes to travel 35 kilometers? By road, how long does it take? Exactly. The, an the answer is it depends. And it depends on traffic, I mean, hundreds of things. What's the traffic? What time of day are we going with a garbage truck? Are we going up a big hill? Are we going across? A, are we going in tunnels? Whatever. So it's an impossible task for us to evaluate kilometres. Kilometres is not a key metric for us. The metric for us is time, and kilometres doesn't necessarily equal time. So if you have a contract where you're saying, how far, do, how long does it go to kilometres, then we're going to give exactly the same answers. It depends. Technology. Now, I'm sure you've all been walking around seeing some lovely tech. Um, as someone who has lived through RFID um, and had the horrors of that, we're very, very conscious that make sure the technology that you're requesting is tested and is 
and is well proven in the industry. This is the latest one. Um, Council's preference is that vehicles fitted with load cells uh, so you can uh, measure individual bin weights. So you're talking about a 20 ton truck potentially driving around on different angles and different weathers, picking up a variety of different bin manufacturers' bins that all weigh something different, and then you're asking us to identify maybe three, four kilos in that. But the technology does not exist to do that. And even if, even if it did, you would have to slow the lift down so slowly, you'd probably need five times as many trucks. So think about what technology you're asking for, whether it exists, not because it's been, someone's read it on the internet. Sorry, there's positive stuff coming. <laughs> After this slide, though. Electric vehicles. Now, we've heard about a lot about net uh, carbon neutral 2050, etc. Um, and we get requested contracts to include electric vehicles. The technology is not ready in a garbage truck to be able to use electric vehicles at the moment. Now, we're running trials. We have a small rear loader on the Sunshine Coast. We're introducing a truck into Toowoomba. Uh, we are doing a hydrogen trial as well. So the contractors, and I, I think I can speak on behalf of all of them, are well aware that councils want this technology, and the vehicle manufacturers are well aware that councils want this technology. But it is not there at the moment. So the the, contract, the uh, vehicle manufacturers are working towards it. We have a Volvo truck going in, which is a factory Volvo truck in Sitsawumba. Um, but that's early on in the process, and we're talking one truck. So just limit your expectations on what this, what this electric equipment can do at the moment. It will happen, but it might be six or seven years away, but we will see. Uh, man, multiple council tenders. So what we've seen lately is we've seen a lot of, uh, particularly in Victoria, where they've tendered together for collection services. Um, so when we go back to the time frame or how much time we need to be able to do our tenders, if you're combining six council tenders together, then you need to give us probably six months to be able to achieve that tender. Um, now, there's no collection cost benefit in terms of combining your tender. There's, the cost of capital remains the same, the cost of the labor remains the same, the maintenance remains the same, and the fuel remains the same. And now, these multiple council tenders offer significant challenges for us because of the time and confusion between the specifications. Um, now, we tendered uh, six, six councils in northwest Victoria. Um, again, time consuming, expensive. Uh, we went through the whole process and the process got abandoned. Uh, we did one in Tasmania, seven shires, again, took us two weeks driving around Tasmania, which is very nice, but again, the specifications, the councils couldn't agree and it got abandoned. Now, my personal view is that council, multiple shires together, cities together, is not the way you should be going. I agree 100% it's a good option for processing and uh, disposal contracts, but be very careful with collection contracts. It's, it makes it very difficult for us. The exception, I guess, is if you've got two very small shires together and you've got, say, half a truck in each, that's a good option to maybe go in together and see if you can get one truck and get a better deal together. Clarity of pricing schedule. So make sure your pricing schedule matches your specification and separate key bits from the collection rate. When I say key bits, I'm talking about bins, uh, bin replacements, education, audits, price per bin per schedule service. Now, we know we don't pick up every bin, but occasionally we, we get a contract where we get paid per collection. And that, again, introduces risk, which makes it very diff difficult for us. And then a separate price for different service types, whether it's garbage, recycled, domestic, commercial, public place, 240s, 360s, wheel out, wheel back, etc. And then respond to questions. If we ask a question, sometimes we're waiting for an answer before we can continue with our, with our tender. So please respond as, as quickly as you can, certainly within three days. And please close out ten, uh, questions two weeks before the tender's due. There's nothing more annoying than finishing a tender and then two days before you get an addenda for a council that changes the whole specification and we're basically back to square one. And it does happen. So bear that in mind, please. 
a suitable price review mechanism. Now, I had a council ring me just after Christmas, and the guy said, I don't think he's here, so I think I can sell this. He said to me, can you, he goes, I'm doing some forecasting for the budget for next year. He says, can you tell me what the price of fuel will be in July? <laughs> and I said to him, with all due respect, if I knew that, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> but I don't know that, which is why I'm talking to you. So we need a rise and fall that reflects what we're doing. So we need labor components, fuel, and CPI. Fuel is up and down like a yo-yo. CPI is just heading north at the moment. So we need to have that security. So we need indexes that are published when the tenders close. So we know what we're doing. And then it needs to be adjusted at the service commencement. So we get adjustment when we start and then every quarter. So what will all this achieve? Well, it means we're confident. It means we're confident that we have given you the best solution we can. And it means that the other contractors are confident, so you'll get the maximum number of tenders received. And what that means is if we can lower the risk without having maybes, without having equipment that we don't know how it works, then you'll get the best value for money. And, that, and if you do the timing properly, you'll get time to assess it properly. There's a tender out in the mo at the moment that's due in June, and council are saying that they will have a decision in July. That is not sufficient time to assess the, a, a, a complicated tender properly. Uh, and what it does, it gives us enough time for a smooth commencement, which is what everyone's, and it gives you the best platform for successful over the term. And excellent service for the community, which is what we all want. So that's it from me. I think we're doing questions at the end. So if you've got any, please feel free to. And if you disagree with anything I've said, I'm more than willing to discuss it. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. That was really interesting. Um, it's going to be, yeah, it's, it's hard to keep all the questions to the end. Um, our next speaker, um, we've got Charlotte Wesley um, from Arcadis. She's a principal environmental consultant in waste advisory. Um, Charlotte's an environmental engineer um, who specialises in the planning and development phase of resource recovery infrastructure projects. And um, through her work, uh, with Waste Less, Recycle More, she's actually been involved in looking and helping with business cases for um, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure projects. So she'll be really acutely aware of the different challenges um, and benefits. And she's going to talk about harmonisation and she's going to kick me, but she's very good at basket weaving. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, some really useful um, tips and things. Thank you to the um, the recent presenters. That's great. Um, yeah, so it's um, been a bit of a hot topic today, hasn't it? Um, joint procurement and um, and harmonisation, and um, you know, I think a lot of other than in this panel, what has been said today is like, oh, you know, we'll just joint procurement, it's all solved. But it's hard, you know, as everyone in this room would, would know, it's a, it's a lengthy, complex process, but it is achievable and um, we kind of have to do it, you know, particularly in Sydney, we've got some real, um, you know, putrescible waste management challenges that need to be addressed. So, um, you know, we've got to come together and, um, and work on these things. Um, so, uh, yep, Charlotte from Arcadis, we have a waste advisory team. Um, you know, we, we work on, a, you know, business case, we work on project planning, um, that sort of thing. Um, so, clickers here, uh, what am I talking about? Um, what is harmonisation? Um, why is harmonisation being pursued? What are the goals? Um, who, who's pursuing it? Um, and, you know, what are some of the lessons learned, um, particularly in relation to joint procurement um, of, you know, processing solutions? And what might be some first steps? So, um, harmonisation, let's, yeah, so we'll get on the same page with, with definitions. So, harmonisation refers to the alignment of waste services or, or standardisation uh, and, and pursuit of shared goals. Um, you know, the, the aim is that it's to support correct usage um, because there is a consistency, there's a familiarity um, across geographies. 
Um, it does not necessarily mean joint procurement. Uh, it does not necessarily mean one size fits all. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's not always the, the silver bullet as well. So, you know, we're going to talk about in what circumstances might it be beneficial. Um, and then, you know, joint procurement, we know it's, it's combining the procurement actions or two of more, um, contracting authorities. Um, so procurement benefits that could flow from harmonization, uh, would be uniform, uniformity of services creates uniformity of specifications, um, potentially improve price transparency because you're kind of comparing apples with apples. Um, investment in infrastructure is supported by harmonizations. The services to, are to be procured or supplied are more predictable. Um, options and tenders are minimized and so streamlines complicated um, procurement processes. Um, waste management strategies can become more harmonized um, and costs across local government areas potentially more equitable, depends, yeah. Um, and sustainable um, procurement of, you know, predictable materials also support circular economy as well. Um, so what can be harmonized? Um, what could be jointly procured, they're not necessarily the same thing. So, um, you know, we've been talking to date about bin inputs, bin systems, all of that. Um, in terms of joint procurement and, and collections, there's, you know, there's little benefit for, for doing a joint procurement approach, as kind of Nick has talked about. Um, there's potentially no financial benefits at, at all. Um, potentially, maybe if you're looking at, you know, consolidating at a transfer station and long haul, uh, there might be some benefits in working together. Um, but really, probably the opportunity is in the, the processing um, solutions as well. So um, coming together improves your buying power through scale. Um, and also, um, as Candice will, will talk about, you can also um, influence the market as well when you've got your kind of performance-based outcomes for your contracts. So improve participation, what well, are the goals? Improve participation in source separation activities, increasing, you know, capture of target materials, improving quality of materials for improved market demand or higher product quality and, you know, attempting to minimise contamination. A, a harmonised system, ooh, not quite there. Yeah, there we go, fancy. Um, could look like, you know, Ideally, um, brands, retailers, manufacturers controlling input materials um, in this, this utopian um, circular economy thing that we're aspiring to, maybe, maybe one day. Um, and then there's also the, the behaviour change component as well with that interface with the households and businesses. That then interfaces with the, the local authorities and their collection systems. Uh, and then the, again, there's that relationship to the reprocessors and closed loop value add. Um, so I, I feel like we've probably talked about this a little bit today already, so I might skip through that. Um, who is pursuing harmonization or joint procurement? Pe people are doing it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a, it's featured in the West, uh, the Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy, like that's a really excellent program that, that Sarah has um, mentioned that um, is a great service and will really help people out. So, you know, hopefully people can get involved with that. Um, and then there's also, you know, obviously we all know about Victoria. Uh, and then in terms of um, joint procurement for processing infrastructure, there's the Southeast Melbourne Advanced Waste Processing Facility as well, which has been going on um, for some time and, um, you know, will hopefully one day lead to some new infrastructure procurement for those councils. Um, what are the challenges with harmonization? There, there are many, and we, we're not saying that it's one size fits all. Um, you know, that we're talking about alignment, consistency, where appropriate. Um, so that, you know, does need to acknowledge the, um, the metropolitan, the regional, the remote, the market circumstances. And, you know, we're, we're working across uh, Australia where there's a, a whole bunch of different uh, policy and levy settings as well, which adds to the complexity. 
um, to address some of the, the barriers or the, the perceived challenges with um, joint procurement. Um, this was a, you know, a, a useful document, shared services in local government. Um, some of the reported concerns with it is uncertainty around costs and benefits, um, perceived risks to autonomy, um, resistance by staff and, and unions to change, um, uh, you know, politics and relationships, and some other commonly held um, beliefs that we've come across um, is economies of scale, you know, although that, you know, is a, is a real benefit for, for processing. Um, the other one is that it, with economies of scale, you're necessarily going to get some price benefit. That, that just isn't the case and always, and some, there's some examples of it, but it's not the only reason to harmonize or, or jointly procure services. Um, and as I've mentioned, it's, it's not, you know, alignment of services and time frames doesn't, you know, need to be a one size fits all. So what are some of the lessons learned um, that Arcadis and Impact Environmental Consulting, um, and Catherine in particular, um, have gleaned over the years of working with um, regional groups is that um, alignment of services is preferable but not essential. So preferences for different waste collection frequencies or other services inclusions can be accommodated within joint contracts. Um, alignment of contract start and end dates are not essential. In some circumstances, such as mobilization of new infrastructure, um, it can be preferable to have that kind of staged approach. Um, joint procurement may not be attractive to um, preferred or smaller contractors, um, so, so that's a, a concern, but that can also be partially addressed through applying a procurement um, a, a document evaluation criteria, which may you know, favor smaller local solutions. Um, and, and further to the point about you know, joint procurements do not always achieve expected efficiency savings. Um, you know, the, the benefits sometimes can be linked to you know, back office things and that sort of thing. Um, but there are successful examples that, that have, um, and again, not the only reason to work collectively. Um, Sarah mentioned about anti-competition. Um, anti-competition risks, um, you know, can be triggered, um, but they can also be addressed, and, and there's examples of that too. Um, multiple services can be produ procured under one service, but um, fewer players are able to offer that multitude of services, so there's, um, you know, less competition, which can be uh, less desirable. Um, it, and also, you know, it, it is a, it's a timely resource intensive process. So I think it's very welcome news to hear that um, New South Wales EPA is willing to, to do some partial funding to, to support that. Um, so, you know, and, and I guess in the earlier sessions today, we talked about, you know, the benefits of long-term contracts in those long-term contracts is gonna have a lot, much longer kind of preparation phase. Um, and you know, whilst it might be a costly and lengthy um, exercise, setting it up right can really you know, bring about the infrastructure that you want um, and also set you up for, for the future as well and um, you know, long-term uh, cost security. Um, you know, some of the, the challenges are agreeing, achieving agreement between councils takes time. Um, continual decision-making is required. Um, so it's best to kind of set up some reference challenges, uh, channels. Um, so like working groups of waste managers um, to refer decisions to a project control group as well. Um, and also output based or performance specifications rather than input based specifications can achieve better technical commercial outcomes. So there's um, you know, efficiencies and, and potentially some cost efficiencies across a wider geography with, with potentially kind of complex services. Um, so yeah, agreeing on objectives in advance can be beneficial for joint tender processes. Um, uh, because any changes could be measured against the original objectives and you know as you're going through the, um, the the process it's always good to kind of bring it back to your agreed objectives and and you know where appropriate refresh those as well um, so benefits and and weaknesses of the standalone versus the re regional approach in again the context is, is processing not not collections is 
Um, you know, the, the appeal of standalone is that, you know, it, it seems low risk and, you know, self-tailored to your, you know, unique circumstances, reduce complexity and, and, you know, may take less time. Um, however, the, the downside is you're in a, you know, a weaker position to influence the market and you might have to be more of a, a price taker. Um, and then, you know, there's potentially limited, you know, opportunity to negotiate because you don't have the same level of um, market influence as if you were doing a regional approach. Um, so with a regional approach, you might have a higher influence over the market, tender process and contract conditions. Um, you might be able to attract more ambitious technologies and services. Um, and yeah, but the, there is the, the, the perception of the, um, the higher complexity. Um, but, you know, it's opportunity to spend a bit of time and get it right initially. Um, so, again, you know, harmonization and, and a joint procurement approach may suit some circumstances, but not all. So you want to be very clear about your objectives and, um, and what you're trying to achieve. And that involves doing your baseline research and, and you know, considering existing corporate plans and waste strategies. Um, you also want to consider the, the appetite um, for joint procurement as well, and that's, you know, through early and often consultation. Um, defining those strategic objectives and being very, um, very, very clear and not having the ambiguity, as, as Nick has, you know, quite rightly mentioned. Um, and I think, you know, to echo another point about thinking about how you can, I guess, get the most from, from the market, which is... I guess, looking at who's out there, you know, assessing the market shape and dynamics, thinking about, you know, when you might be bringing this opportunity to market and not, you know, flooding it at a, a difficult time or an uncertain time and that sort of thing. So um, that can also help you to get, you know, better results and then, you know, developing that robust um, procurement plan as well. Uh, and then, you know, considering whether you're doing a single stage or a multi-stage uh, procurement process as well. Um, you know, with single stage, there's the perception it can be, you know, quicker and cheaper. Um, Multi-stage, there's more of that, you know, opportunity to kind of negotiate and, and potentially get the specific outcomes you want. But again, it's, it's challenging within the, the context in, in which we work um, uh, and, the, and the legal frameworks as well. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's me. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for, for your time. Um, and I think we'll do questions at the end. Um, so, yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> thank you. Um, so we've got our final speaker now. Um, we've got Candice Myers, who's flown all the way from Western Australia for this presentation. Um, Candice is a business engagement coordinator at CleanAway. Um, she's got eight years of experience managing both landfill uh, minimisation business and also working in education and community engagement, uh, where Candice was telling me she's constantly travelling around WA in the Northern Territory. Um, which would be really interesting from an education perspective. Um, she is very qualified. The other thing that stood out from her bio is she is a TEDx presenter, um, which, I don't know, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> so, anyway, welcome, Candice. Hello to the last of the last. Thank you so much for still staying here. Um, I'm sure we're all going to um, get out of here and go and get ready for this big 60s party, and I'm really glad I'm doing this today and not tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> I'll bring that up. So, uh, my name's Candice, and I work for Clean Away in their solid waste services at the, as the education um, and engagement coordinator for WA and Northern Territories. Over the last two days, the recurring buzzword of collaboration has been consistently mentioned, and this has been a great segue for my presentation. 
as its collaboration with our client that has brought the success to our curtain contract that brings me here today. So while collaboration has been suggested as a strategy to solve many of the issues that, we, um, that bring us to meet at conferences um, to discuss, I'm excited to present evidence for how collaboration can lead to gains in the ever present war against waste. So let's talk about performance or outcomes-based contracting and how this type of procurement framework works from a waste management perspective, using Curtin University and CleanAway as our case study. I will identify both the benefits and challenges in implementing and managing this type of contract and discuss how this may look in the future. Firstly, what is a performance-based or outcomes-based contract? I consider both outcomes and performance-based contracting to be the same thing. And there are some that will say that they are not the same. However, Dr. Andrew Jacopino, a notable Australian expert in contract management, and specifically performance-based contracts, argues that they are, due to both fundamentally incentivising the customer's outcome. My preferred performance-based contract definition is that contract focuses on the desired outcome of how the work, of the work to be performed, the what, rather than the manner in which it is to be performed, the how. This model is not new. In fact, this procurement framework was pioneered in the US in the 1960s. I didn't realize the synergy there between the 60s to night until I reread this earlier. <laughs> but steadily in the last 20 years, and markedly since COVID, the use of this form of contracting has increased Performance-based contracts differ from service-based models by typically having the following. A focus on contractual outcomes rather than, the, than how the activities and tasks are performed. The use of measurable performance standards that are tied to the required outcomes. And a range of monetary and non-monetary consequences, either rewards or sanctions for the contractor based on performance. So in short, Performance-based contracts require the contractor to achieve KPIs for the vendor without being tied to specific processes in order to reach those KPIs or how the work is ultimately performed. For opponents of performance-based contracts, the set of indicators or KPIs used to measure the outcomes are often cited as a reason not to use them. It is therefore essential when designing KPIs that the following is taken into account. Achievable performance standard for each um, indicator, define process to collect, analyze, and report data for the selected, oh, sorry, I think I've gone to the wrong slide, for the selected indicator, and a range of monetary and non-monetary consequences, either rewards or sanctions for the contractor based on their performance. In the case of Curtin CleanAway contract, the predominant KPI that we have is around landfill diversion. But there are also KPIs around safety, service delivery times, and reporting. And they are comprehensively laid out in our contract. Successful performance-based contracting also um, very heavily relies on collaboration, there's that buzzword, between the client and the contractor. It is essential that there's transparency, strategic planning, and that there's a genuine alignment of both the service provider and the customer's interests. The way the contract is laid out provides continuous innovation to not only meet KPIs, but surpass them. Performance-based contracting has been gaining momentum in the environmental sector as organizations become more aware of their environmental footprint and move to more sustainable outcomes for business. In a, uh, in a 2022 systematic review of 71 performance-based contracts by Bagrazi et al. from the University of Oxford, they found that 69 of, of the studies reported the following reasons for utilizing performance-based contracts approach in environmental-based projects. It incentivized the desired, uh, the desired environmental end, provided reliable long-term performance, allow a flexible and innovative service, and that transfers financial risk back onto the private sector. Although Curtin is um, one of our commercial clients, many of you today are from councils. So it allows the private sector to share in that risk of uh, 
reaching the, the KPIs that, that you need to do. So how has CleanAway successfully implemented performance-based contracts at Curtin University? Curtin University is the largest university in Perth. The campus is 116 hectares and it has the same footprint as the Perth CBD. I put in my slide there that the Brisbane CBD is 136 hectares. It might be a little bit more relevant for the East Coast. The university promotes uh, campus engagement to students and the wider community, not only in terms of academia, but as a place that can be enjoyed by students and the wider community through social and su supporting events. Curtin strives to be more than just a learning institution, but rather a key stakeholder in both local and wider communities by creating what they refer to as a sticky campus, encouraging people to utilise the campus all year round. They have recently completed their exchange pro, uh, precinct that hosts a hotel, apartments, an IGA, and numerous eateries that adds another exciting layer to life on campus. So why did Curtin want to outsource the waste management services? The existing waste management was an in-house team. They had poor landfill diversion rates, which was sitting about 26%. The waste team had been operating with the same processes for about 20 years. Nine staff were employed to manage the waste on site. However, when entitlements such as annual leave, sick leave were taken into account, this didn't necessarily equate to nine staff daily and resulted in lack of service continuity. Operation staff brought all the waste back to the centralized compound where it was then sorted by hand using pickers the separated waste was then collected by individual waste contractors. That resulted in a lack of cohesiveness towards a centralised goal of becoming a more sustainable institution. Curtin University prides itself on its commitment to sustainability and has been continually looking for ways to lessen the impact of the environment. Improving their waste management services on campus was a necessary step in the university's sustainable planning with the goal of minimising waste to landfill. Their objective for waste services was to go beyond just having a service provider on site that simply removed the waste. They needed to engage a contractor who could proactively manage the entire life cycle of the waste generated on campus. They realised that, therefore, that they required a different procurement process, which led Curtin to a performance-based contract model. Performance-based contracts need to have key strategies in place to reach their KPIs. For this contract, the following strategies were deemed essential. We have a dedicated on-site clean-away uh, clean team at Curtin, support and placement of our clean-away strategic assets, education and engagement, strategic partnerships, exceptional service delivery, communication and engagement, and continuous innovation. CleanAway have a dedicated on-site team at Curtin University consisting of an operations supervisor, three drivers and a waste coordinator, myself, who manages all the engagement and education on campus. Together, they ensure all day-to-day -day operations run smoothly and efficiently. Having a team on site allows us to be part of the campus, which makes it easy to understand how a campus works day to day and allows us to research innovative ways to assist with landfill diversion. It also ensures excellent collaboration and engagement with Curtin staff who are, integral to, who are integral to our success on campus. Keen Away assets have given us the ability to ensure excellent service delivery. Vital to our success are both our South Guildford MRF and our large fleet, which ensures no downtime when maintaining our Curtin dedicated assets. As the waste coordinator on campus, I ensure engagement with multiple stakeholders across the campus. This has allowed for beneficial and meaningful relationships to develop. This ensures that CleanAway is investing in not only the environmental success of landfill diversion, but also the education and social benefits of the students and staff on site. I am supported by CleanAway's national marketing team, um, ensuring the creation of quality content and programs like our Green Years program. 
To effect long-lasting behavioural change and reach a wide demographic, I ensure that our programmes and engagements that we roll out include various interventions, not just education. We also utilise interventions such as environmental restructuring, which includes strategic bin placement throughout the campus, training through lectures and presentations, enablement by ensuring that we provide solutions for the types of weights that is being generated on our campus. Also, we model the desired behaviours by having manned way stations at certain events. This ensures that the types of engagements we roll out are varied and diverse. Examples of engagement include social media, face-to-face -face engagement, and hosting clothing swap days in line with the Buy Nothing New Month. I've presented guest lectures, spoken on Curtain Radio, and mentored students from various disciplines in sustainability winter units and inter-university challenges. Clean Away also prioritises supporting and collaborating with our local industries and specialised recyclers. Examples of partnerships that have contributed to our success include Clean Away Daniels, which handles all our clinical waste, Total Green Recycling, started by two brothers who used to attend Curtin University, who are specialised e-waste recyclers, Simply Cups, who are innovating coffee cup recycling, and depackaging solution options for our organics. To ensure the contract and the day-to-day -day operations are running smoothly for the university, Curtin have one and a half staff members overseeing the daily operation and the portfolio manager for public places and facilities managing the contract. Curtin operational staff share an on-site office with CleanAway staff, ensuring that information is relayed quickly and effectively and any issues that arise on campus can be addressed collaboratively and efficiently. Communication is key to successfully managing any contract. In addition to the Curtin and Clean Away staff interacting daily, we have monthly meetings between operational staff and managers, bi-monthly waste education meetings between myself and the contract manager to keep update with current waste trends on campus, which have in part been identified in our quarterly waste audits. We can then identify what engagement we should action on campus for example, utilising the Curtin social media networks. Curtin is a large and complex facility, and to ensure students are safe while commuting between classes, as well as contractors servicing the site, vehicle access times are restricted within the academic core between 9am and 3.30pm. CleanAway had to rethink how we would deliver services while working within those safety and time frameworks set up by Curtin, and meet our service delivery targets. CleanAway's vehicles on campus are easily identifiable and we are visible as a team as we perform our daily tasks. On occasion, there have been misperceptions of how we perform services which have been incorrectly reported. Fortunately, our focus on continual and transparent communication has allowed us to address any issues and use the opportunities to further educate stakeholders. We have also had to redesign some of our processes while being based outside our Perth Metro branch, as the contractual requirements sometimes differ from older processes used in service-based contracts. For Curtin, moving from an internal waste management system to a contractor created some legacy issues where new processes were unfamiliar to some users across the campus, and that created and caused some resistance. Like any large organisation, Curtin is multi-departmental and requires many approvals from different stakeholders before items can be approved and implemented. Curtin is also very culturally diverse, attracting over 6,000 international students to our Bentley campus, and we have to be mindful about what language we use and how we educate and communicate, because that can be misrepresented by those who are not familiar with waste management. By taking on the totality of waste management on board, CleanAway has been able to work closely with Curtin to establish an innovative, holistic approach to waste management. Curtin's large size allows for us to use scale to find alternative disposal methods. We can provide partners with not only quantity, but single stream quality uncontaminated products for resource recovery. Being on site allows for unique immersion into campus life that could not be achieved remotely 
and the performance-based service model drives us to identify alternative solutions for sometimes unusual waste streams. Having access to the entirety of Kinaway's business allows us to ensure landfill is always our last resort. We have also developed a customised portal that allows Curtin to track our monthly progress in terms of landfill diversion. But it also allows us to compare year-on-year -year data and understand the waste, tre uh, waste trends in line with the academic calendar and other outside influences. KPR landfill diversion were set targets that the contractor had to achieve. In April 2020, when we started, our baseline diversion was 26%. By April 2023, diversion was recorded at 72.91%. This was 4.91% higher than the third year KPI of 68%. Not only did Clean Away team exceed the target by nearly 5%, but we did this without being able to rely on the technology of waste to energy that was, anticipated, that was anticipated to be available when the contract was drawn up. CleanAway and their on-site Curtin team have continually worked to ensure all diversion options have been explored and have, taken uh, and have been taken advantage of. Understanding that a university is a complex organisation with many stakeholders where decisions that could minimise landfill does not, always work, sorry, does not always fall into the purview of the Curtin Waste team. CleanAway has worked with the team to audit waste produced and written reports to advocate for processes to change within the university organisation to promote waste minimisation and landfill diversion. While our main achievement is landfill diversion, other achievements we have been recognised for include being a finalist in the Waste Sorted 2022 awards in the commercial and industrial category. In the engagement space, I mentored a Curtin Sustainable Development Goals Group they won their challenge and was recognised at the United Nations WA Gala Awards. And last year, Curtin and CleanAway jointly presented our contract success at the Perth Weight Conference. Working as a United team has helped us achieve the above awards and shortlistings. And together we are proactively trying to improve waste management for Curtin University. So has performance contracting worked for Curtin University with regards to waste management and achieving the KPIs? The diversion targets achieved as well as the other achievements send a resounding yes. Curtin wanted to partner with a company that could not only achieve landfill diversion through strategic assets such as a MRF, but also through innovative and out-the-box thinking. This needed to be underpinned with excellent service delivery and transparent and open communication. By employing key strategies for managing this contract, together Curtin and CleanAway have surpassed the KPIs originally set. The processes are pushing the norms for how an organisation can lessen their environmental impact and are ensuring that we are at the forefront of what it means to operate in a circular economy. Curtin and CleanAway will continue to work together for the life of the contract and hopefully beyond continually, to continually innovate CleanAway service offerings and Curtin's diversion. The biggest impact going for, forward we can make is within, is within procurement. We need to start building business cases for sustainable procurement across the many departments and faculties. We are also looking for ways to ensure that we are participating in circular economies at both, state, uh, at both local, state and national levels. So I'll just leave you with the quote that I think really sums up what we do at Curtin University. Sustainability is not a goal to be reached, but a way of thinking, a way of being, a principle we must be guided by. Thank you. Oh, great, we've got a microphone. Thank you, they were, they were really fantastic. Um, talks that really complemented each other. Um, it's really over to you to ask questions, but I mean, everything, I don't know, you know, I feel like it's a re recap. <laughs> you know, we've got, we've got you know, Sarah, Sarah, you could ask so many questions about the practical rollout of this task force, which is really interesting. Nick was definitely, um, would have raised, I'm sure, must have raised lots of questions, um, giving real insight into the contractor perspective of, of what to look for. Charlotte, 
Um, you know, in terms of her experience with harmonisation and it's like, I mean, that, that really flows through all the talks and, and had a really clear set of pros and cons and, um, and, where, and benefits and, you know, where it's not always appropriate. Um, and Candice's talk, I think that is a really interesting model. I mean, I had no idea a university, you know, picturing it, it really is like an ecosystem, like, like not so different to a municipality, really. And it, it's almost like a case study where they're able to actually step in and, you know, is that something that where, where are the analogies between, um, you know, that and local councils? And, and I guess two of the key themes that I saw were um, information um, and how important it is, and, and that flowed everything from the EPA's task force in the, in the planning stage in terms of what data they have to the market data. Um, you know, Nick raised, well, obviously, like, you know, it's a key part of you know, Nick's presentation in terms of how important it is to get this information right so they can properly price tenders. Um, and then even like, you know, Nick's comment about, you know, when there's multiple councils going out to tender together, um, how problematic that can be. And I was sort of kind of wondering, is that something the Joint Task Force can be involved in as well in terms of feeding that information? So, because councils often don't even know when other councils are going to go to market together. Um, and, you know, the other thing, I, I guess, planning. I mean, so, so often, um, I don't know, I, get, I guess I get frustrated um, as a lawyer in these processes when people say, look, we really need to take this approach because this is going to achieve... We need, to, we need to go to market at this point in time and this is the best way to do it. Or we can't do this because it'll lead to a longer negotiation process. So focusing on process, uh, I guess, outcomes rather than the actual delivery outcomes, and that all comes from lack of planning and um, I kind of think one of the... The flip side of, you know, the focus on joint procurement is that it, it should have um, kept, they kept sort of talking about, you know, through um, the different presentations about the need for early planning for joint procurement, but in a way it's kind of a good discipline that, you know, I, I feel like sometimes when, when councils do decide to jointly procure, not always, but sometimes at least that actually forces them to think about the objectives early, think about the, the constraints and the benefits and can lead to sort of some better outcome. Sorry, I didn't want to take up any of this time. Move it over to them. Has anyone got a question? Uh, hi, Emma Thompson, Scenic Rim Regional Council. Uh, I don't think any of those joint examples were us. Um, thanks for screening, if definitely that's the not. case. <laughs> um, so definitely appreciate the do's and don'ts. I was just wondering, Nick, if you had any um, examples of positive innovations um, in contracts? <laughs> Is it me? Not really, no. <laughs> uh, sorry, positive. <laughs> Uh, yeah, obviously, like, I mean, a, a lot of what I focused on today is the negative because they're the kind of things that slow us down. It's always the sort of small bits that you kind of focus on, like a lot of the things are good, a lot of the innovation is is coming through in terms of integration with councils, in, information systems, uh, you know, some of the technology that we, we're implementing into trucks, some of the things about, you know, even things like detecting council potholes and increasing the viability of the service, so... There are some positives as well. Thank you, Emma. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Alice from New Zealand. Um, a question, and it might be, um, you might all have some views on this. Um, something that came up earlier in the day was um, alliance contracting model. And I just wondered if, as panel members, you had some thoughts on where alliancing might fit in in the waste procurement space. I might let someone else answer that because you probably won't like my answer. <laughs> anyway. No, no. Um, and also we have the master in the audience, Catherine Driscoll, so <laughs> um, I also would yeah, be interested in her perspective on these things. Um, yeah, it, it's, I think, some, um, you know, points that were made earlier in the day about um, risk sharing is, is you know, a, a very good point. Um, and I think um, having that kind of um, established at the outset about, you know, who's managing what risks and how is that distributed uh, is, a, is a good example. And, you know, there have been some examples of alliance um, models in, in um, waste um, and, and in Sydney. 
Um, and you know, there's there's pluses and minuses for it. Um, I think why it's kind of particularly relevant now is we, we do need to bring about new infrastructure to meet our um, needs of um, increasing diversion of organics from, from landfill. And so if we're, you know, following a, the, the mandatory, um, you know, FOGO policy, we need, we need further infrastructure to be able to process um, the, the food and garden organics waste when it's combined or, or the food organics only. Um, so working together to bring that about is, is useful. And then, yeah, also again, it's, it's responding to our, our, our needs for further um, residual waste processing. So um, yeah, I, I think alliances can, can work and I'd be happy to, to talk more about pluses and minuses as well. And um, I'd also be interested to hear what Catherine has to say. And she has a mic and she's the next question, so. <laughs> oh, that's too big a topic to address in before <laughs> five o'clock when everyone needs to leave. But uh, I do have a question for Nick, um, for local council collection contracts. Some, occasionally um, we still get a council that wants to combine collection and processing under one contract, um, putting aside the contractual problems that we have with that approach. Um, just wanted to get your take on when you see a collect and process contract come out. Well, m my view is that collection and processing are different skills. Uh, like we're a collection contractor, we do it very well. What we don't do so well is maybe you know, food organics processing, and there are specialised companies to do that. There are companies here today that specialise in, in, in recycle processing. They understand the commodity markets better than we ever would. So our preference would always be to separate the collection contracts from the processing and disposal contracts and leave that bit to the experts. We've seen in Sydney Metro that you have problems with trying to procure a subcontractor for processing. Yeah, well, that, that's true. Well, it's not just the subcontract, it's the risk. So, for example, we had contracts with, that we were responsible for with MRF contractors, and then obviously when China saw it happened, all the prices went through the roof and we're kind of left stuck with it. Um, so we would, yeah, we would recommend not including the processing as a separate one, if I can make that any clearer. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? <laughs> Sorry, Nick. Sure. Yeah, because um, another thing that's coming up a lot lately, especially, you know, with delays at facilities and, you know, with all the, especially, you know, following whether it's the flooding or bushfire impacts, etc. how do you, you know, what's your ideal, I guess, what do you see count, a council's role is in, in managing that interface risk, like from your perspective with, with the processing or disposal facility? Yeah, I mean, obviously there are disposal of particular ones where the waits are very long. So we're sort of burning time, sometimes 45 minutes an hour waiting to get in. Um, so in that scenario, we really need the support of councils to be able to speed that process up. And it, part of their contracts with their disposal and processing operators to have incentives for, the, for those people to make sure that the flow is, is happening quickly. Because obviously you've got certain large disposal facilities that have a hell of a lot of trucks going into them and that can cause delays and as you said you get some bad weather at some of the landfills and it's queued up and can i uh, <laughs> yeah okay i'll let the audience go sorry you go <laughs> no my, my my question is probably it's not a question it's more a statement to to support nick's kind of commentary about the marriage in general transport if you've got delays you've got the right to risk or share the risk with your your customer and i think that's got to be if you're going to be buying into large procurement components as councils. Keep in mind a transport function is bottlenecked at certain times because of the way the runs are built and the way we collect bins. And the waiting times are significant because you can't find another truck, you can't find another way of doing it and we've got limited times. We've got EPA saying don't go in there too early. Uh, you've got to be out of there by this time. There's a lot of KPIs within councils and I think risk mitigation and risk sharing is paramount around those waiting times. Also the risk of fires, you know, a truck yeah. going up in flames. Um, we were the messenger, we picked up that load. Uh, it's about how we correct that through good messaging, behavioural change and support with your contractors. Think of it as a working relationship for the term that you're doing it, not a supervisor versus contractor relationship, which is where a lot of contracts historically have been. You know, it's like being locked into a restaurant. I said it this morning to some other people. 
It's like having a contract for seven years with a restaurant that you bought food once and was pretty good and then the relationship kind of goes wrong after the second or third year. But you can't buy food from anywhere else. You're locked into that contract for seven years. So keep in mind your due diligence is around getting a feel for who they are. Do your good scope on who specialises in certain things and, and Nick's comments around, you know, stick with the ones that are good at what they do. There's enough of them out there and there's a lot of really good companies who want to buy in. But the bigger the project, the less competition you will have in the quality of the service and the price point relative to it. It's more a statement, I apologise, but I, I support everything you guys have said on today. I just want to reiterate from a contractor's point of view that it is harmonisation, it's about commitment, it's about loyalty and support and, and working together, which is critical to this moving forward. Yeah, thanks Adrian. I mean, it, that's, partnership is really important. Talibun from Randwick Council. So my question to Nick is long-term, short-term contracts. What are the benefits of each and what is the optimum um, length of contract which serves both parties? Um, from, from my point of view, a contract for a collection contract should align with the vehicles so uh, typically a vehicle will last 10 years um, sometimes longer sometimes 11 years 12 years um, but i would recommend a 10-year contract that's what my preference would be and i think that's what you'd get your best price point at um, happy to be if anyone disagrees adrian or anyone with experience of that david reckons yes so yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if if, you, if you're looking at a contract where you want someone to build a, a MRF or a Fogo processing facility, then you, you you really need to think about longer term than that. But for collection, that's the key point for me is the the vehicle write-off, which I reckon ten years is probably a good good amount of time. Hi, a uh, question for Sarah or Charlotte. Is there, and in keeping with Talibul's question, is there a sweet spot for facilities then? So if we're councils with 10,000 tonne but we really need 30,000 tonne, like how do we know how many partners we require for a recycling facility or a FOGO facility? Um, it would depend on, yeah, the, the stream that you're looking at and um, the, you know, the type of infrastructure. Um, so ag again, I think, you know, you never want to be too prescriptive about the infrastructure type. You want to be talking about what your performance expectations are. However, you would know that the mature technologies for um, things that can process FOE would be X, Y, and Z. And then you'd be looking at, well, well those you know, typically might be um, 150,000 tonnes or, or less. And then you would probably work backwards, could be how you could approach um, potentially a, an, an, a, a joint procurement process for um, a particular type of infrastructure. If it's for, um, you know, there's lots of different opinions on, on thresholds for infrastructure, but, you know, um, you know, energy from waste, it, it can range from, you know, typically people want about a minimum 300,000 tonnes, um, but, you know, there's, there can be smaller or larger and, you know, they typically want more. Um, so that's how you could potentially work backwards to think about how many partners you might need. And then you'd also want to be thinking, you probably want to have some contingency as well because people do drop out of the procurement process. So you might want to start with a larger number as well. Um, it's a real balance to hit that sweet spot around what an inf what the, the tonnages are needed to make the process um, viable and, and, you know, to give people the right gate fee. Um, but then there's also the, the balance of, you know, having people commit with minimum tonnages to these things. So, um, yeah, lots of, lots of things to, to say around that, but um, I'll, I'll pass it over to Sarah. I don't think nothing okay. to add. <laughs> Just coming back to someone earlier who was asking, are there any positives or, you know, have, have the contracts getting better? Um, I suppose from my perspective, which is in the engagement in education, when we do our bids and tenders, you know, before we would have no education supplement into those contracts. The, the councils weren't looking for education. And 
as the contracts are going on, they want more education, and that benefits us as, as the contractor because at the end of the day, if your residents are putting batteries into our into our bins and then into our trucks. They cause fires. Obviously, um, we're having issues with MRFs and, and processing facilities. So I would say there's definitely that's more positive, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, and councils want great product. They want you know contamination lowered. Um, they want you know not to have burning trucks in their streets and, um, and um, you know, outside their residents' homes. But it really needs, as, as an industry, we really need to start pushing behavioural change. And that's not a education piece. Behavioural change is a lot more in-depth than that and requires a lot of science and a lot of money. Um, so from my perspective, in, in an organisation that's core business is, you know, logistically moving waste and processing it, um, it's so important that we have more money spent in that realm. But councils don't necessarily want to do that because I think in the past it's always been this little puff, fluffy piece on the end. And we really need to get behind really changing the way our residents view their waste, and that obviously all comes into waste minimisation and circular economy and that. But if we don't have that, we're not going to get very far. We, we've had $60 million um, put into the Recycling Modernisation Fund, and when I asked one of the Canberra officials, well, what about the education? He was like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, well, how do we expect those facilities to stand longer than 10 years, I'll South Guildford Murph burn to the ground after two because of what we assume was a battery. Um, we, we, need to, we need to really start looking holistically if we want to get into this whole circular economy. Thank you. Oh, one more. Joe. Hello. Uh, Joe from Bayside Council. Uh, this is an EPA question. So, obviously, um, the last time that the, um, the EPA model contract was last revisited was around 2016, I believe. And obviously a lot of things have changed since 2016 in our industry. Uh, obviously that puts a lot of our, the councils that are tendering, which we recently had to do, at a significant disadvantage because we're virtually recreating that document to modernise it to today's conditions. Is there something that you guys are doing in that space? Absolutely. So um, the joint procurement service that I spoke about earlier, um, one of the things that we are looking to set up there is that library of materials. Um, and one of the things that we are looking to explore there is a whole range of different things that we would be able to make available to councils to help support procurement. Um, and certainly model contracts um, is one of the things that we're looking at um, and whether we can update um, what, we, what we've previously provided um, and that being something that might be able to be accessed. Thank you. Everyone, can everyone thank our speakers again? We've, oh. <laughs> now, all I was going to say is I'll let you go because you've got, a, we've got the party in an hour, but, and I imagine, I don't know, you'll stick around five minutes or so if people want to come up and ask more questions.